So welcome everybody again. I am Ola Langren. Uh, it's really a great honor, a great pleasure for me to, to be here today. Thank you for, uh, for coming here to the building uh, in person and thank you so much for joining online. I know, know that a lot of people watching uh, via Zoom. So I have been here for about one and a half year. I'll just give you a very brief back background of who I am uh, and my perspective on my loan. I was asked to give some perspective what I think myeloma is going to be in the future. So I'm a physician scientist. I have been a doctor for more than 25 years. I've been in the United States almost 20 years. I did my MD and PhD at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. When I was in fellowship, I was advised by senior doctors to not work on two diseases. One of them was chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and the other disease was multiple myeloma. And the reason was that there had not been any development for such a long time. And I thought that sounds like a great area. So I picked myeloma and I'm really very excited uh, to be part of that movement together with many other people. During my career, I've already seen how we changed the disease from a disease where patients were diagnosed and sadly could only live for one, two, or maybe three years to now patients living for 10, 20 plus years. And I strongly believe that Patients that are diagnosed today, there are many patients that probably have the same lifespan as a person with the same age and gender without myeloma. The difference being that there still has to be ongoing therapy. It may not be true for every patient, but I think more and more patients will be able to benefit from it. We still have to work to find and establish a cure for the disease. And that's what we try to do in our research lab. And that's what a lot of other groups are trying as well. We have come a very long way over the past 20, 25 years. And I'm really very proud of what the whole community has been doing. And I'm blessed to be part of a fantastic team. So I came here about 20 years ago uh, to the US and I came to the NCI in Bethesda in Maryland, outside Washington, DC. I initially planned to stay for two or three years and I ended up stay staying for 10 years. And we built the myeloma program there. I was then recruited to Sloan Kettering and I worked there for about seven years. I was recruited to build up their program for myeloma. And uh, Dr. Neimer, who is the cancer center director here in Miami, he used to work at Sloan Kettering for over 20 years. And he told me one day I will recruit you to Miami. I said, I don't think so because I love New York. I'm going to stay there. He said, well, there's a life after New York. And eventually Dr. Neimer said, okay, Here's the offer. I said, so I asked my wife, do you want to move? She said, when are we moving? So we moved here one and a half year ago. So I was the second doctor to join. And uh, in one and a half year, we have been growing the program very fast. And we now have six doctors on faculty. I just finalized the offer letter for the seventh myeloma doctor. And we have over 40 people on the team. I think within 12 months, we will probably have 50 people and I do think within three or four years from now, we will have a size of the same caliber as we had at Sloan Kettering. I think we will have 10 faculty here. So we're going to establish a very strong program. And my goal when I came here was to build one of the top three myeloma centers in the United States within five years. So I have three and a half years left to deliver that. And that's what we're going to do. So I put together some slides, giving a little bit more data behind what I'm talking about here. Grow through innovation. That's something I learned in my prior jobs. Growth by itself is not, for, this shouldn't be the focus. It's really the content. So I told you we have five years to build one of the top three centers in the United States. The first year we have recruited a lot of key team members. We just became an independent myeloma division. This happened uh, in last month. We have already filed to the university for an independent myeloma research institute that's going to be embedded in the cancer uh, center. This will happen before the end of this year. So the difference between the institute and the uh, division is that the division hosts all the clinical individuals, the doctors, the nurse practitioners, the nurses, the patient coordinators, all those individuals that we need to run the clinical program. And the Institute hosts all the researchers and many people are part of both of them. This is only centered on myeloma. This is how we can become one of the top three centers in the United States within five years. 
this will be the vehicle that we will use to continue to recruit talent in order to drive this forward, we need to have the smartest people. A lot of people are calling us almost every week want to come here and join us. We will continue to develop trials and our internal research, and we will continue to foster this culture of myeloma, breathing the myeloma innovation every day, helping patients, driving the field forward. And my, my mantra to the team every day, every week is do a good job and be kind. Do a good job and be kind. Those are the two things that we all try to do every day. All these people I recruited in 2021, uh, many of them come from Northeast, many New Yorkers, people from Boston, people from Washington, DC. Uh, I think David Coffey made his longest move. He moved from Seattle to Miami. He came from the Fred Hutch Cancer Center. I think within a year, there will be another 10 or so people here. I was very uh, happy to receive an endowed chair by the university in October last year as a sign of the fact that they believe in us, they believe in the research we're doing. This gives a very strong platform to advance the field forward for us. And many of our members have got a lot of recognition in this very short period of time award called John Levy Memorial Award, which is the award that the highest scoring abstract for the American Society of Hematology, the ASH meeting has for junior investigator. And we have also worked to establish the myeloma research network that we now have with collaborators around the world. We have a lot of collaborators here in the US, many collaborators in Europe, we also have collaborators in, in other parts of the world that have not yet been so much involved in myeloma research. We have groups in Africa, we have teams in Asia, and also in South and Latin America that we are partnering with. Just to share with you some numbers, uh, what happened here for the program. We grew about 30% the past year. The follow-up visits grew 25%. The number of patients that came to us doubled in one year, new visits. So I tell the lab, the clinical lab, the x-ray, the, the radiology department, all the services that we work with, I said, this is the good news. The bad news is that next year is going to just keep on coming. This is how it looked when I came to New York. We're going to hit 10,000 visits for the program uh, within three to four years. The enrollment on clinical trials is also going up. And this is because we continue to offer a lot of new drugs here. We bring all the newest molecules, all the newest immunotherapies. We have the biospecifics, we have the tri-specifics, we have the CAR T cells coming, and we also have small molecules. When I was at Sloan Kettering, when I came there, we had less than 50 patients on clinical trials day one. And at my tenure, after seven years, we had over a thousand patients that were enrolled. The way I think about it is that the trials are only there to help those individuals that are looking for options beyond the standard of care. If standard of care is not good enough, if patient needs something else, that's when these trials come. The patients, of course, are not here to support the trials. It's the trials that are here to support the patients. And we develop a lot of trials internally. When we see there are needs, we develop trials. I've developed over 50 trials myself. The whole team here is writing a lot of new trials to fill the gaps. And we go to the drug companies and we ask them if they can provide a drug for trials that we have designed ourselves. In our research lab, we have a lot of people working on genomics. I think that medicine is becoming more and more centered around data. Just like everything else in the world, it's about data. If you have a lot of data, then you have an advantage. But if you understand how to analyze the data, that makes you very, very successful. I brought a lot of people from New York and from Europe and from Boston and other places here to run very complicated, what's called computational oncology analysis. And we have, we have pretty much downloaded all the publicly available data sets in the world for myeloma, and we have them on our servers. And we are studying the disease in, in detail through these computer models. We're trying to understand 
people who have MGUS and smoldering myeloma, we want all those individuals to never progress, but some people do progress. Why is that? How could we stop that from happening? The biology-driven trials, I think it's gonna be the next wave for myeloma. Instead of giving every patient the same therapy, if we had a better understanding of the biology, we could pick the right drug, drugs for that individual patient. What are the underlying mechanisms of resistance? Why do drugs work and then all of a sudden stop working? If we could figure that out, maybe we picked other drugs or we could try to stop that mechanism of resistance from happening. An area I worked on for over 15 years is minimal residual disease detection or MRD detection. To develop new assays and to try to understand what that residual disease looks like. If we could find the last cells and characterize them, we could find the Achilles heel and we actually have a shot on goal to find a cure for myeloma. Also, the role of the immune system, I think, is probably going to be very important as patients continue to live longer and longer. And I think our internal own personal immune system is probably part of the treatment for the disease. I think we will need to develop new drugs that can strengthen the immune system. First, we get rid of the disease, and then we probably have to help the immune system to make sure the disease does not come back. This is future. And to me, future is like just a few years out. These are very complicated slides. I'm not going to walk you through all of them, but I just show you this is what we do. We are very geeky guys when we are at work. Myeloma is very complicated. You have all heard about fish and cytogenetics. That you can check for five or 10 markers. If you do this analysis, every patient with myeloma have 6,000 of these. Myeloma is shaped by eight mutational signatures. There's very little literature about this for myeloma, but in other cancers, there's a lot of information on that. There's something called complex events in the biology literature for cancer. The myeloma field has started to realize, oh, that's probably important. It's very important. Fish and cytogenetics are from the 1980s. It's black and white TV versus high definition 8K. This is happening. This is going to move forward fast. We have found, if you look in myeloma patients, that there is a whole catalog of changes that you can find. And we have taken this knowledge into MGUS and smoldering myeloma. We have seen that some cases have it in the middle and some don't. And when we track them forward, if you don't have them, you're in the red line. After over 10, 15 years of follow-up, there is no progression. If you have them, unfortunately, that would be an indicator of progression. And you see that here that it's within two years for the majority of cases. We just opened a study where we want to do an earlier detection uh, of myeloma by using this approach. And I think earlier initiation of therapy could be an option if you find evidence of these genomic changes. And probably most importantly, someone who's MGUS or smoldering who do not have these changes, that individual does not need a lot of therapy, should probably not be enrolled on clinical trials, should not be enrolled on clinical trials um, for smoldering because there is no genomic uh, reason for that. We opened a trial called the TRANSFORM study, and this is open for enrollment. Patient can come here to Miami and do a biopsy, and we generate these signatures. We also published last year for newly diagnosed patients, a study where we showed that we could deliver very high rates of no detectable disease. Dark green means that we cannot find the disease. You start from the left and go to the right. Every line is one patient. You see almost all of them turn dark green. It's fantastic. It's 71% of patients turn dark green, so it's great. But there's 29% that are not dark green. So we are, we are very, overachievers here. We have 29% left. So we've gone through everything with this genomic test. We have done whole genome sequencing. We've done single cell sequencing. Now we're back to these geeky slides. We can look for a lot of different changes in the cells comparing individuals that reach a deep response versus those that are not having a deep response and try to understand what's going on here. I'm not going to go through all of this because then you have to stay here for the whole weekend. 
So we're just picking one, and one is called XBP1. And that's a gene that we found, if you have a mutation in this gene, that's actually gonna impact the prognosis. So other studies have talked about this gene before, and they've shown that it could be important, it could not be important. And there's been like a little bit of conflicting data. And I think this study has solved the problem because on the very right, there is a red line, and uh, this is XPP1 on the bottom, and it says CD38 on the side. So that means that if there is a mutation in this gene XPP1, CD38 is not active on the cells of myeloma. Why is that important? Because CD38 is the target for daratumumab. We found one of the resistance mechanisms for daratumumab. If the cells develop mutations in XBP1, there are two map doesn't work. This is most likely not the only mechanism, but it's one of them, and this is very important. These are the type of discoveries you can do if you have access to all the details of, of the disease. And you, of course, need to have the full annotation how patients were treated. That's what we are working on in the lab. We're also working to develop single cell approaches in the blood, circulating DNA, protein detection in the blood. We want to launch more and more technologies for tracking of the blood to make sure there is no disease, to avoid having to do biopsies in the bone marrow, to do blood-based tracking. We are not yet there. The world has not yet developed the final test. This is something that needs to happen, and we are doing a lot of work on this. We also have taken other approaches. We develop technology in the bone marrow, we technologies in the blood. But sometimes the disease may not be in the bone marrow. It may not release enough material in the blood. It may be hiding somewhere else. How could we find it? So we all know that you can pick targeted therapies to treat the disease, but you could also use the targeted approach to find the disease. So you take an antibody, in this case, daratumumab, and we developed this when I was in New York, and we label it with something called zirconium-89. And then we, we started in the lab, we took mice, and we had myeloma on the left, on the top there, and those below do not have myeloma. These were just examples of mice we had in the lab. And then we injected these antibodies, and on the top right, it lies up in the bone marrow. So this proves that these antibodies in the mouse can find the myeloma. This gave us confidence after a lot of work. We did many, many experiments. We wrote the protocol and asked the FDA for permission to take this into patients. And here's an example of what it could look like in a patient. And here I identified in day six evidence of the disease on the very right, on the lower part. In the middle, you can also see with the CAT scan, there are destructions in the bone. And on the left, it's a combination of the two. And also to shed light, how does this perform in relation to standard PET CTs? The same PET CT that everyone has in the world. This is what that could look in one of these individuals that we have so far imaged. Within a week, the same person participated in the study. And you can see that the antibodies could identify disease. This is the same person one week apart on the left with standard PET-CT, on the right with this antibody uh, PET-CT. We have opened a new study here in Miami where we are offering this for patients. So a newly diagnosed patient or a patient who has a recurrent disease could be worked up like this, could be treated with a therapy, whatever the therapy is, and could be re-imaged like this. And if there is any residual disease that we find, if the patient agrees, we could take a needle and take out those cells and try to genomically characterize them and see how is it that they can avoid uh, the therapy. Can we use this to identify a cure? The last few slides I have here are focusing on the immune system. We have tracked patients who are treated successfully, became MRD negative and sustained MRD negative for many, many years. We have patients that have been MRD negative for 10 or more years. We compare their immune system to individuals who unfortunately did not become MRD negative. And what we see is that there are a lot of differences in the immune system. And here's one of those slides that if I go into details, you have to stay the whole weekend. So I'm not gonna go there. But there are a lot of differences in the immune system if you compare these groups of samples. 
here's another of those slides that would probably take two uh, days to go over. So we looked at all the different subsets of the immune system. And the bottom line here is that when we track the immune system over time in someone who is treated successfully, who becomes MRD negative and sustains MRD negative, the immune system almost normalizes and looks almost identical to some degree compared to a healthy person that has been a volunteer. We have compared to people who volunteer to do blood work in this study. I think the immune system is something that we also need to pay a lot of attention to in the future. This is the last data slide. It's also one of these that we spent a lot of time talking about, but I wanna make a few points here. We published two papers in the journal called Nature Communications in the past 18 months or so that are behind this slide. And there is another paper in review in one of those journals that uh, is, is not fully uh, covered by the slide. The high points are here that we have found, it's well known that myeloma has an average age of onset around 70. But it can happen even at age 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 and, and over 70. But the average age in the United States is around 70. We have found that there is genomic evidence that the disease starts at the age of 20 to 30. And it sits in the body for 40, 50 years. That's very puzzling to us. We're trying to understand what those regulatory mechanisms are. The other part of the story here is that when there is a relapse, in later relapses, I always thought that there are a lot of cells sleeping in the body and they could become active. This study that we have done shows that it's one cell that seeds very, very fast throughout the body. And within months, it could go everywhere and then the relapse would happen. That really has given us more and more confidence in in the approach that we need to find that last cell and get rid of it. And then the last part here that's in review is that we are trying to understand how these things maybe together play a role to prevent the development of other malignancies. Some people could develop second malignancies. We don't want that. We have to pick the right therapy so we don't introduce and cause these types of things. There are a lot of other people in the team that are working. I'm not gonna go over that. The overall goal is to seek a cure for myeloma. That's the goal of our program. We are launching the Institute this year, and it will be approved before the end of 2022 by the University of Miami, a freestanding myeloma institute within the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center. And our goal is to become a global leader in the development of novel therapies and MOD assays within two to three years. And this has to happen in collaboration with pharma and biotech and also to establish our program as a global leader in computational oncology. This is the data science. And I think we are very far along. And I'm convinced that we're gonna reach these two goals. It's gonna be a lot of work. We have two, three and a half years left to become one of the top three centers in the US. So what we are seeking collaboration is the launching of the Institute, the translational science and the computational oncology. I would like to thank all the members and our, our team, um, our collaborators externally, all the funding support. We have very many collaborators. And I would like to thank you so much for your attention.